Tefram the Syrian, Path of the Spirit. Welcome to this, the third lecture of our Archdiocesan Conference on the Lights of Antioch. We now welcome Father Jonathan, Father Jonathan Hemmings from the parish of Holy Cross Morecambe near Lancaster, also halfway between. We've had some difficulty locating you, haven't we, Father? But we kind of decided that it's Morecambe now, uh, I think, maybe. Um, welcome, Father Jonathan. You're going to talk to us about St. Ephraim the Syrian, another light from Antioch, a great port and sage of the Holy Spirit, the heart of the Holy Spirit, St. Ephraim the Syrian. Father. Christ is risen. Indeed, is risen. <laughs> Say the reverend fathers and brothers and sisters in Christ. St. Ephraim the Syrian. I've entitled this the Poetry of Repentance. And before I speak about Ephraim the Syrian, this great saint of the 4th century, I want to quote from another great saint of the 20th century, the recently glorified Saint Porphyrius of Mount Athos. He said, the soul of a Christian needs to be refined and sensitive, to have sensibility and wings, to be constantly in flight and to live in dreams, to fly through infinity, among the stars, amidst the greatness of God, amid silence. Whoever wants to become a Christian must first become a poet. <laughs> well, there you have it. Whoever wants to be a Christian must first become a poet. Poetry and poets have a long spiritual heritage and tradition within the church. St. Ephraim is one in a long line of those who expressed their love of God in poetry. And this literary form, when it flows from the heart to God, is not a self-indulgent, esoteric pastime. It's the vehicle in which the Word of God is allowed to distill in the soul and then fly to God so that love and adoration and glory may reach the heavens. And the Word of God reverberate in the hearts of others. <coughs> Indeed, poetic verse goes back to the very creation itself. In Genesis, it is the Word that acts and makes the universe to be. The Old and the New Testament are imbued with truth expressed in poetic imagery. We read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in Genesis, God says, He says, the Word, let there be light, and there was light. St. John the theologian, like St. Ephraim, drew upon Greek and Semitic forms. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is foolishness for Greeks and a stumbling block for Jews. And yet, Plato understood the Logos as the logic and rational principle behind the universe. The idea, the concept, was conveyed by the Word. In the second verse of the Bible, there is a poetic couplet and a play on words. Bereshit bara Elohim, hashamayim wa'aretz. 
from Biblical Hebrew, tohu, and the word vohu. In the Biblical Hebrew, there was nothingness, there was void, there was emptiness and desolation. Right in the first verses of the Bible, we have a rhyming couplet, tohu, or vohu. And we know that St. Gregory was impressed by the exegesis of St. Ephraim on the first chapters of Genesis. Poetry, then, has a strong provenance in the Bible. The Psalms of the Prophet and King David convey the very struggles of our human condition. Our questions, our fears, our place before a holy God. Indeed, the nature of God and man is not only juxtaposed, but considered in parallel meter. From royal psalms to psalms of lament, the whole gamut of human experience is voiced before the God of the heavens. The prophets of the Bible were called mouthpieces of God. The word or the oracle is prefaced by Ko Amara Adonai. Thus says the Lord. And then the prophet launches into an oracle or a prophecy. In Hebrew, the word traditionally translated <coughs> as prophet, Navi, Navi, is a proclaimer. Deuteronomy 18.18 18. God says, I will put my words into his mouth and he will speak to them all that I command them. Thus, the Nabi was thought to be the mouthpiece of God. The root letters of Nabi, Nun, Bet, Aleph, denotes an openness to God. The Spirit of God, the Ruach Kadosh, fills our lungs and we reflect His glory through our open mouth. A poet must write, a prophet must speak. Poetry has been called the son or daughter of prophecy. The word meditated upon and transcribed often through one's own experience. In the wisdom book of Job, Job meditates and tries to understand about God through his own experience. The Proverbs encapsulate in a two-line stanza a very profound insight into life, an observation. In the prophetic books and, of course, in the parables of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, we read and hear metaphor, simile, allegory, that elegantly shapes our Lord's teaching, grounding it into the experience of his listeners. A poet discerns beauty in doctrine. He paints prose in images as an iconographer would do when he writes his words in pictures. He or she looks at God and his creation from the periphery of life, in an orbit around Christ, and presents his light and truth through the mystical prism of rhyme, of cadence, of image, and of meter. Poets like prophets are therefore loudspeakers of God's word. St. Porphyrius then invites us to be constantly in flight, to be sensitive to God and his energia, his energies, and to live amidst dreams and visions of what can be. And then we are made lighter 
than the heaviness of our sins through the acceptance of God's love, expressed and returned as glory and praise in the beauty of verse. I like the image of a kite. <clears throat> when you launch a kite, you need the uplift of the wind. You need the Holy Spirit when we are to be made alive. The wind or breath or penevma of God, the Ruach. But we need the strings of doctrine to guide and direct and control. And so now to St. Ephraim. He was born in the 4th century in the ancient city of Nisibis in Mesopotamia, where the Roman Empire bordered on the Persian Kingdom. And the two were in constant conflict. At one time, Mesopotamia belonged to Syria. And for this reason, St. Ephraim is known as the Syrian. He was born of Christian parents, sometime before the Edict of Milan, which was issued in 313 AD, probably around 306 307. He later writes that his ancestors confessed Christ before the judge, and I am related to martyrs. When he was a baby, his parents had a prophetic dream in which they saw that the boy's tongue became a vine from which an abundance of grapes fruited. And birds came to eat the grapes, but the more they ate, the more profuse the clusters multiplied. Such was their prophetic vision for his sermons, his hymns, and his poetry. And we're reminded, of course, of Christ's own words, I am the vine and you are the branches. St. Ephraim recounts his rather rebellious youth. And there are some anecdotes from his early life which we have. He says, one day my parents sent me um, out of town and I found a, a pregnant cow feeding along the road. I took up stones and began pelting the cow, driving it into the woods till evening, when it fell down dead. During the night, wild beasts ate it. On my way back, I met the poor owner of the cow. My son, he asked, did you drive away my cow? I not only denied it, but heaped abuse and insult upon the poor man. A few days later, he was idling with some shepherds when it grew too late to return home. He spent the night with them. And that night some sheep were stolen and the boy was accused of being in league with the robbers. He was taken before the magistrate and he was cast into prison. And in a dream, an angel appeared to Ephraim and asked him why he was there. And the boy began at once to declare that he was innocent. Yes, said the angel, you are innocent of the crime imputed to you. But have you forgotten about the poor man's cow? And when Ephraim saw the tortures in which criminals were subjected, he became terrified. He turned to God and vowed that he would become a monk if God would spare him such a cruel ordeal. And the magistrate, however, just laughed at the youth's tears and ordered that he be stretched on the rack. 
But just then a servant came to announce that dinner was ready. Very well, said the magistrate, I will examine the boy another day. <coughs> and he ordered him back to prison. And providentially, the next time the magistrate saw Ephraim, he thought he had been punished enough and dismissed him. Although he was spared the rack, Ephraim had learned his lesson. And like the prophet David, he entreated the Lord to overlook his youthful folly. True to his vow, upon his release, he went straightway to the hermits living in the mountains, where he became a disciple of St. Jacob, St. James, who later became the great bishop of Nisibis. So Ephraim was born again in repentance. Ephraim began to train as an athlete of virtues, exercising himself in the study of the Holy Scriptures and in prayer and in fasting. The passionate and wayward youth was transformed into a humble and contrite monk. I put monk in inverted commas because there is some question as to whether he was <coughs> formerly tonsured. Weeping day and night for his sins and entirely surrendering himself to God. St. Ephraim's earnest resolve pleased the Lord who rewarded him with the gift of wisdom. And so grace indeed flowed from his mouth as his parents had seen. And like a sweet stream he was baptized <coughs> at the age of 18 after instruction by St. James, the Bishop of Nisibis. And he became a deacon, and he remained a deacon in the church. St. Jerome writes that St. Ephraim persuaded the rich to distribute their money to buy corn for the poor. When there was a famine in Edessa, to which he moved later, it's said that Ephraim experienced a little Pentecost upon being ordained deacon and was endowed with the knowledge of Greek. The language of his poetry and prose was Syriac. Well, some of us have had a, a longer and ongoing struggle with the Greek language. Indeed, I remember when I was a, an undergraduate, I foolishly took um, a course in Ugaritic from <laughs> Rajshamra, trying to, um, I had an interest in the 8th century prophets um, of Amos, Hosea, Micah and Isaiah of Jerusalem. And I thought this would shed some light on the religion of Baal to which the prophets were speaking. Well, the translation did, but the language didn't. <laughs> uh, because Ugaritic is rather like um, a, a, a wet clay which a pigeon has walked across, <laughs> and there is no, um, th there are no uh, vowels at all. So you can imagine what it was like when we were trying to read the text in Ugaritic in one of these seminars. Perhaps if I hadn't have taken it, I might have got a better degree. <laughs> the adventurous campaign of Julian the Apostate, which for a time menaced Persia, ended in disaster, and his successor, Jovianus, was only too happy to rescue from annihilation some remnants of the great army which his predecessors had led across the Euphrates. To accomplish even so much, the emperor had to sign a rather disadvantage, uh, a disadvantageous treaty and by the terms of which Rome lost the eastern provinces among the cities ceded to Persia was Nisibis in 363. So to escape this cruel persecution that was raging in Persia, the Christian population abandoned, abandoned Nisibis, and Ephraim went with his people and settled first at Beit Gadvaya, 
then at Amid, and finally arriving in Edessa, which is, I think, the modern-day Urfa in Turkey, some 100 miles to the west of Nisibis, where he settled and wrote most of his hymns and poems. Now, Edessa was more Hellenistic than Nisibis, and at that time had a strong Christian population. Much of the information about St. Ephraim comes from the 6th century, some of which is historically inaccurate, but <coughs> symbolically important, as Dr. Sebastian Brock says in his 2013 IOCS lecture. So some examples may be cited. There is one famous example of where it's said that a woman in Edessa was staring at St. Ephraim quite intently. Why are you staring at me, woman? asked St. Ephraim. You, sir, should be staring at the ground, for you were taken from the earth, but woman was taken from man. There is also a tree in Egypt in the monastery of St. Bishoy, Salmos, <coughs> which is said to have flowered from the staff of St. Ephraim. Whether the saint actually went to Egypt is doubtful, but it serves as an icon of that harmony, symphonia, which he had with the monastic tradition. St. Basil sent envoys to try to persuade him to become a priest and raise him to the episcopate. But Ephraim did not want this. St. Ephraim shared that common experience with some of our brothers and sisters from Syria today. He was an exile, he was a refugee, and he was one related to martyrs. And now for the relief of your eyes and for the nourishment of your soul, we'll watch a short YouTube clip of his life. Christianity has a long history in the land east of Jerusalem, the land from which Abraham sojourned on his way to what is now Israel, the land where once mighty powers emerged, such as the Sumerian, Babylonian, and Assyrian empires. In part due to the Muslim conquests of the 7th century, but also due to the vast geographic and cultural distance. Many in the West are unaware of the rich spiritual and cultural heritage of the church east of the Holy Land. In the past few years, there has been awareness only through tragedy, as we continually witness the destruction of churches and monasteries in Syria and Iraq, and the displacement of a Christian population that has existed there for over two millennia. This long history began soon after the resurrection of Christ, as faith spread from Jerusalem and Antioch east toward Syria and Mesopotamia. As recorded by the church historian of Senios, the Apostle Thomas sent one of the seventy a man named Thaddeus, to the city of Edessa in Syria, soon after Pentecost, to preach the gospel. By the second century, there were enough Christians in Edessa to support the construction of a church. Thus began the Syriac tradition, whose golden age spanned the 4th through 8th centuries. During this time, great centers of learning flourished in Edessa, Nisibis, and Nineveh. Sacred sites, such as the tomb of the prophet Jonah in Nineveh, were set apart and venerated by pilgrims. A great number of monasteries and churches were built. Saints, such as James of Nisibis, who was one of the 318 bishops at the First Council of Nicaea in 325, Saint Jacob of Seru, 
St. Isaac the Syrian, and an untold number of great ascetics and martyrs labored for Christ in this land. But of all the saints, none contributed more to this tradition than the one who was there near the start and is today seen as its pillar, St. Ephraim the Syrian. From his life we can learn much about this time period. Ephraim was born in the eastern Roman frontier of Mesopotamia during the early 4th century, close to the start of the reign of the Emperor Constantine. His parents lived in the town of Nisibis, and there Ephraim also lived for most of his life. According to several accounts, one night his parents had a dream in which they saw a vine spring up from their son's tongue. The vine grew until all under the heavens were filled by it. From the vine hung clusters of grapes, and all the birds of the sky came and ate of its fruits. His parents no doubt wondered what this could mean, especially in light of their son's youthful behavior. As Ephraim later wrote, I was born in the path of truth, even though in my childhood I was unaware. For even though born into a Christian family, Ephraim spent his early years in reckless fashion, guided more by prodigal thoughts and a fiery temperament, rather than by good judgment. As he later recalled, my youth would almost have convinced me that what happens with us in this life occurs but by chance. But the providence of God brought hot-blooded youth to its senses. And so, according to the providence of God, one day a citizen falsely accused Ephraim of stealing <coughs> sheep. Ephraim sat in prison for days lamenting what he saw as a random and unjust occurrence. But one night while he slept, an angel spoke to him, saying that the punishment was due to his many sins, and that once freed he should return home and repent. This spurred in him a thorough self-examination, and upon release he withdrew to the neighboring hills where several hermits lived. He became the disciple of St. James, and from him learned much about the Bible and the ascetic life. Several years later, James was named Bishop of Nisibus, and Ephraim continued with him as his assistant. Ephraim served first as a reader and then as a deacon and catechetical teacher. Now a devout Christian, Ephraim fully committed himself to a life of service to God and others in the church. He spent much time in study and shared what he learned through teaching and writing. Ephraim is best remembered today as the great poet of the Syriac language, the predominant language in the region and a dialect of Middle Aramaic. With Nisibis being a meeting place between East and West, Ephraim's style developed under the influence of the Mesopotamian literary tradition, Judaism and Hellenism. His blending of these influences created works filled with extended metaphors, profound theological insight, and beautiful rhythms. He wrote across genres, including standard and rhythmic prose, versified homilies, narrative and lyric poetry, and a great number of hymns that are still in use today. His most well-known work is the Prayer of St. Ephraim, now used in Orthodox Church services during Great Lent, and no doubt a product of his own repentance and ascetic labor. O Lord and Master of my life, give me not the spirit of sloth, idle curiosity, meddling, lust for power and idle talk, but grant unto me, thy servant, a spirit of chastity, integrity, humility, patience, and love. Yea, O Lord and King, Grant me to see mine own faults, and not to condemn my brother. For blessed art thou unto the ages of ages. Amen. Ephraim probably expected to remain in Nisibis for the rest of his life. But in 363, the Emperor Julian died in battle, and the peace treaty that followed gave control of Nisibis to the Persians. Ephraim became a refugee in his late fifties. And along with much of the displaced Christian population, 
moved some 100 miles further west to Edessa. But even this became a blessing for him, as the final decade of his life in Edessa was also his most fruitful period. In Edessa, Ephraim combated a number of heresies, including those of the Martianites and Arians. As in Nisibis, he won the love and respect of those he served. He even encouraged women to chant, becoming, as Saint Jacob calls him, a second Moses for women. Ephraim also intensified his asceticism during this period. Although not a monk in the traditional sense, he lived a very similar way of life. In the Syrian tradition at this time, organized monasticism such as was seen in the deserts of Egypt and Palestine had not yet fully developed. Rather, many like Ephraim lived in a community of ascetics who remained celibate and devoted to God, but also remained active within the church and community. Ephraim spent much time in service to the sick and the poor. In 373, a great famine plagued Edessa. Ephraim noticed the wealthy hoarding grain, and so he challenged them. How long will you fail to pay attention to God's compassion, allowing your wealth to be corrupted, to the condemnation and damnation of your own souls? Rightly convicted, they entrusted Ephraim with their grain and he did much in Edessa to feed the hungry and care for the sick during the famine. When the famine ended in 373, he returned to his cell and a month later reposed in peace. Ephraim left behind a large corpus of writing in Syriac that is still being translated to this day. Though many hymns have been lost, over 400 still remain. Because of the great beauty, eloquence, and wisdom found in his writing, Ephraim is now known as the Heart of the Holy Spirit, confirming the prophetic dream that his parents once had when he was but a child. His work, like the many clusters of grapes in the dream, fed the faithful in the East and enriched the spiritual and cultural heritage of the Syriac Church. Today that heritage is being destroyed. As we witness the stream of refugees from Syria and Iraq, the destruction of churches and holy sites, and the execution of many Christians, let us remember both the long history of the church in this region, and also pray for those affected by the great tragedy. Let us continue to remember saints like Ephraim, James, and Isaac, so that even if all that remains in their world is destroyed, we still keep them alive in our memory. And these hymns 
are full of rich imagery drawn from biblical sources, folk traditions, and other religions and philosophies. These madrasae are written in stanzas of syllabic verse and employ over 50 different metrical schemes. And each madrasae has its kalma, a traditional tune identified by its opening line. All of these kala are now lost. But here again, there is a remarkable parallel with our own English Anglo-Saxon and herdsman called Cadman, 657 to 680. Uh, he was a, a poet also, setting the gospel to poetry and music and singing it as a mouthpiece of God throughout the northeast of Britain. So poetry is not limited to place or time or culture. It is that universal song of the soul in every place and for each person and in every generation. Spiritual poetry is not a nationalistic thing or a tribal matter because it is the language of heaven. It is that stream of living tradition from which we drink. We gathered here are sons and daughters of Christ and I and you are adopted sons of Antioch. Serving in, in my case, that most northern part of Lebanon called Lancaster. Oh. <laughs> Morecambe. Well, from Malula in Syria to Morecambe in Lancashire, there is a strong monastic <coughs> presence and love of poetry. St. Patrick, who may I remind my Irish brother and sisters that he was from the northwest coast of Britain and was taken by pirates to Ireland. He founded a monastery just a mile down the road from our church. Sixth century monastery. I urge you to go there and feel the presence of the saint, which he established all those centuries ago. It's like being on Mount Athos. Well, he wrote his Lorica, the breastplate of uh, St. Patrick, which is so beautiful. We won't have a look at that, I don't think, Father, but just to say that you will know the Lorica, which is an expression of the love of the Holy Trinity and the binding of poetry to the soul. And they shall come from east and from the west and from the north from the south, and they shall sit down in the kingdom of God. I remember as a theological student at Oxford sitting in a lecture on early church history being given by Father <coughs> Callistos Ware, as he was then in 1981, before he was elevated to the episcopacy. And actually sitting next to me was my dear friend, Father David. And sitting next to us, was um, the principle. Well, the Callistus began his lecture with the words, We of the East. <laughs> <laughs> and Father David, uh, Hope, that is, who later became the Anglican Archbishop of York, whispered in my ear at this point in his rather rich West Yorkshire accent, you know he's from Bath, don't you? <laughs> you can't get much further west than that. <laughs> but you can get much further west because we have Father Alexander from Canada, of course. <laughs> so, St. Paul saw that the future of the church lay with the Gentiles and made it his mission to bring the gospel to the nations. The springboard of that was Antioch. The missions to the world was from Antioch and still is. Likewise, St. Ephraim was moved from Syria, from that Syriac world, into the world of the Gentiles, into the world of Hellenism. St. Theodoret and Zosoman were sometimes rather chauvinistic about his poetry because it was written in Syriac and not in Greek. Anything that wasn't in Greek was barbarian. 
So we barbarians here in Britain, <laughs> likewise, are not some part of the diaspora. We are part of that gathered community of the kingdom of God, <coughs> as all who are converts to Christ and who are received into his church through baptism and chrismation. The Holy Spirit moves us as he moved St. Ephraim. Many move and are moved from their birth country and their culture for the sake of the kingdom of God and for the gospel. St. Ephraim is often called the son of the Syrians, the column of the church, the harp of the Holy Spirit. He lived at a time when Emperor Constantine I, whom do I need to remind you, was declared Augustus Emperor in York. When Constantine died in 337, the Persians seized that opportunity to invade the northern part of Roman Mesopotamia and the city of Nisibis. And when his own death approached, he told his friends, Sing no funeral hymn at my burial, wrap not my carcass in a costly shroud, erect no monument in my memory, allow me only the portion of the place of a pilgrim. For I am a pilgrim and a stranger, as all my fathers were on earth. On January the 28th, 373, after a brief illness, St. Ephraim reposed from his labours and was received into the heavenly habitations. The citizens of Edessa called him the harp of the Holy Spirit. And now, centuries later, his works still echo in the souls of humans, inspiring us to share that sweet fruit of repentance. Famous in his life and revered at his repose, Soon after Ephraim was falling asleep, he was remembered in a public address by his contemporary, Gregory of Nyssa, who closed his remarks by asking Ephraim's intercession. You are now assisting the divine altar and before the Prince of Life with the angels, praising the most holy trinity, said Gregory. Remember us all and obtain for us the pardon of our sins. In his poetry, St. Ephraim wrote over 400 lyrical hymns, over a million lines. Some scholars say even more than that. He used image and method drawn from that range of sources. He modeled his teachings from rabbinic Judaism, from Greek science, from philosophy, from Persian mysticism, from symbolism giving them an overarching Christian rationale. He wrote narrative verse in seven-syllable couplets and lyric poetry in stanzas. Some manuscripts survive from the 6th century in Egypt and in St. Catherine's <coughs> Monastery in Sinai today. And throughout the ages, poets have gathered the silk of wisdom and the golden threads of truth and woven them into that garment of their own life experience like the 8th century prophet Hosea, whose own marriage became a metaphor for Israel's unfaithfulness. unfaithfulness. Poets are rooted in heaven with their eyes and their ears on the earth. They are eclectic by nature, drawing on those often tangential perspectives which invade their human senses and spiritual sensitivity, viewed through the prism of faith, always. Poets live on the periphery, and in this sense they are also true eccentrics. St. Ephraim wrote, Virtues are formed by prayer. Prayer preserves temperance. Prayer suppresses anger. Prayer prevents emotion of pride and envy. Prayer draws us into the soul, the soul into the Holy Spirit and raises man to heaven. Such God-centered thoughts bring us tears of joy and repentance. Another saint of Antioch, St. Isaac, a Syrian, said, From stillness 
a person gains possession of three causes of tears, the love of God, awestruck wonder of his mysteries, and humility of heart. Tears became the, the accompaniment and the hallmark of St. Ephraim's teaching. In his poem, The Pearl, we see how suffering becomes the seed to which to grow. O oh Lord Almighty, aid me. Grains of sand their way inside me ceaselessly find. Afflictions provoke my widow heart. Harass me, vex me, pester and grind. May your beautiful veil over my soul drape. Thy love wrap, forgive hapless soul, pardon, evade the trap. Oh, may resentment and anguish desert. Oh, may my wounds be moulded to pearls. Thy grace, Redeemer, my soul of thorn. Heal, pray, aid me, suffer thy nails. Like your glory resplendent on the cross, assist me, Redeemer, to die with thee. O oh, blessed sweet Jesus, restrain, impede, prevent me, an oyster, barren to be. St. Ephraim often spoke of our Lord's presence under the image of fire in the bread and fire in the wine, which brings life. In his visible vesture there lies <coughs> hidden power. In the poem, Waters and the Wind, St. Ephraim writes, the sea by the cross was subjected to the unbelievers. For had the crucifiers not made a cross of wood and hung upon it a sail in the likeness of the body, the voyage would have halted. O bosom, pure type of our Redeemer's body, <coughs> that which breath is filled. Though unbounded, yet it closed it in. By the breath that dwells in the linen cloth, live the bodies in which dwells the soul. Again, we have a word play on breath and spirit. The linen cloth is also mentioned as to call to mind the Eucharist, the Antimincium, upon which the bread and the wine is placed and become for us the body and blood of our Saviour. The imaginative, symbolic, the poetic characters <coughs> of the Ephraim's poetry far from making things obscure and hidden, reveal to ordinary folk the teachings of the Church Fathers. The works of St. Ephraim are too numerous to mention, but if you want to read some poetry, then I'd refer you to Dom Edmund Beck's translations of his poems and Sebastian Brock's The Luminous Eye, The Spiritual World and the Vision of St. Ephraim. St. Ephraim then urges his disciples to pray for the gift of tears and to pray for others. In spite of the gifts which God so lavishly bestowed upon him, St. Ephraim remained deeply humble. He even feigned madness as to avoid being consecrated a bishop. Doubtless his humility was guarded by the remembrance of those past sins of his youth and by his contrite spirit which followed upon his remembrance. But while tears of repentance constantly flowed from his eyes, Ephraim's face was bright and shone with joy. St. Gregory writes, where Ephraim speaks of contrition, he lifts our thoughts to the divine goodness and pours out thanksgiving and praise to the Most High. So we have three aspects to his teaching. Contrition, Compunction and compassion. Contrition, that Latin contritus, which means ground to pieces, crushed by guilt. This is certainly true if we look at his early life, <coughs> in his own experience of God and in his later teaching. In spite of his parents bringing him up as a Christian, Ephraim was wild and rebellious in his youth, unbridled even. But he looks back on it. I would quarrel over trifles, act foolishly, gave in to bad impulses and lustful thoughts. My youth nearly convinced me that life is ruled by chance, that God's providence brought me impassioned youth, my impassioned youth, 
to the light of wisdom. <coughs> His compunction, that moral principle that prevents us from doing evil. But in our orthodox faith, it's more than that. It's the penthos that expresses tears of compunction, of mourning, of the puncturing of the heart which pierces to our inner being, exposing our true feelings. And the gift of tears reveals to us the misguided ideologies, the pretensions, the manipulations that we strive to acquire, as well as the obfuscations which we try to cloak ourselves with. These tears free us from the lying and from any form of hypocrisy, softening the heart leads to greater self-centeredness. Penthos leads to greater God-centeredness. In our Orthodox tradition, the sacrament of confession is sometimes called the mystery of the second baptism. The ones who truly confess their <coughs> sins are baptized again in their own tears, symbolizing the inbreaking of truth and freedom. The sacrifice of God is indeed a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Tears are the essential element of the monastic way. Tears of compunction are often stirred when we deepen our introspection. Our self-examination begin to realize all the ways in which we have turned away from God and from our true selves. We discover something authentic, authentic and meaningful, and grief is unleashed over having ignored it for so long. Compunction comes both through God's grace and our own open-heartedness. Protodeacon John Chrysarchis writes, Tears and weeping indicate a significant frontier in the way of the desert. They bespeak a promise, in fact. They are the only way into the heart. Tears are agents of resurrection, ushering us into the new life. A life lived awake and fully present. St. Ephraim writes, Give God weeping and increase the tears in your eyes, through your tears. And his goodness, the soul which has been dead, will be restored. And compassion, pity and concern for the suffering of others, for St. Ephraim, the medicine for the soul and body was compassion. Compassion, contrition, compunction flow into one another. He became in later life a much sought after, compassionate spiritual father who warned new converts not to attempt excessive works of parents. He wrote, if you have shown compassion for people here on earth, that will be of wonderful help for you at the day of judgment. Who will cure my soul, if not thou, o Christ, the only physician of souls? Where will I find a remedy for the disease of my soul, if not with thee, O fountain of life? Thou who didst cure the ailing woman, cure also my soul from the ruin of sin. So, I want to return to Cabin. I said that I would return to a British saint. For whilst we must honour all poet saints, we must discover and convey to the world our own ones. In the time of Cadman, the cowherd, many of the Bible stories were conveyed by means of singing, singing, poetry, storytelling. As we know, writing materials and literacy was a rare commodity in Saxon Britain. Of course, there were notable exceptions to this literary scarcity. The double monastery that Hilda founded at Whitby, monks and nuns were encouraged to write beautiful, illustrated manuscripts of biblical texts. It is also significant that Ephraim was described as a second Moses for women, specifically female liturgical choirs, which he established in Edessa. St. Ephraim had a great respect 
for the women saints of the Bible. We in Morecambe just been blessed with a wonderful female choir from Thessalonica for Pascha. The beautifully illuminated Lindisfarne Gospels written by the disciples of St. Aidan on the Holy Island and the work of St. Bede at his monastery in Jarrow where he wrote a history of the English Church and where he translated the Gospel of St. John and other parts of the Bible into English are all testimonies of that monastic love of scholarship. We see St. Mark we see his symbol, which was prefigured by Ezekiel the prophet. We see Greek text. We see St. Luke. How Byzantine. We see the four Gospels. It is significant that alongside this rather exclusive literary pool of spirituality, resident in mon monasticism. There was that missionary activity that was generated from these spiritual powerhouses of prayer and learning. Indeed, St. Cadman, a monk himself, was attached to a school in the monastery at Whitby, from which missionaries went to all parts of Northern Britain, teaching the Word of God. And again, often in verse. We know that St. Hilda led the double monastery for men and women at Whitby. And it, it is significant, I think, that there is a double monastery in Essex <coughs> all of these years later. Perhaps in God's will, we will have our own monastery one day. Scenes from the life of Jesus were acted out. Gospel accounts were rendered into easily retained verse and passed on to the ordinary peasant by such travelling poets. Again, we know that in St. Ephraim's time, there were those who delivered homilies in verse, and often to music, somewhat akin in style but not in content, to our modern rappers. This ancient form of oral tradition, whilst being true to the text, allowed for personal inspiration as well as divine revelation. There was also, of course, that unique factor of delivery. Some today embrace the social media, some fear it, but certainly a medium for transmitting the faith. The progenitors of such oral transmission have a biblical origin and a pedigree. The Gospels were written some 20 or 30 years after our Lord's resurrection and ascension under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The evangelist recorded that which was recited, remembered, treasured in accordance with the holy tradition, the paradose, and the charisma, which was preached in the church. In our generation, the world relies greatly on instant information, but this needs to be sifted through knowledge and distilled through the wisdom of the fathers. Our own Orthodox Christian faith encourages us to learn the liturgy by heart and treasure it in the heart. It is unusual to see the laity in the liturgy reading from service books in their hands. Rather, the active reception of the word and passive participation in the liturgy is engendered, having the effect of the worshipper being attentive to the word of God through chant and ritual, which hallows the senses. Familiarity with the liturgy gives birth to a spiritual dynamic and a joy. It's not essential for a psalmist or reader to be able to read, but it is desirable. What is important is his ability to intone the hymns of the many feasts and saints, such are learned from soaking oneself in the timeless depths of the liturgy over years of attendance and attentiveness. Within the tradition of the church then, St. Ephraim shows that poetry is not only a valid vehicle 
for theology, but in many ways it's superior to discourse. That is not to say that St. Ephraim did not write in prose. He did, against many heresies of Marcion and Arius. Poetry fills the senses, requires reflection, demands debate, provokes response, and stimulates the imagination to be constantly in flight and to live in dreams, as St. Porphyrius says. St. Ephraim also encourages a way of reading the Holy Scripture that is rooted in a synthetic trust more than critical analysis. How rich this is for one who, like me, was an undergraduate where critical liberal Protestantism passed for theology. I thank God for my study of Hebrew and Greek, and indeed in some ways for Ugaritic, <laughs> that anchored me to biblical foundations. <coughs> St. Ephraim displays a deep sense of that interconnectedness of all things. He is an artist in words, God's words, and the gatherer of all good things. St. Basil uses the image of the bee as our guiding principle. He does not forbid secular or philosophical reading, rather that we should be discerning like the bees. Then we will understand that secular learning has honey to offer, if we know where to find it, and how to take the pollen and transform it into something which is sweet and beautiful and useful. St. Basil says that poetry which is just sensual <coughs> offers us nothing, and we should eschew it. The biblical texts are the principles to guide us. We should approach learning and reading with discrimination and find what is good and useful to imitate the bees, not the flies. So Ephraim is set within this great galaxy of stars of orthodox saints who present truth beautifully. Blessed is the person who has consented to become the close friend of faith and of prayer. He lives in single-mindedness and makes prayer and faith <coughs> abide with him. Prayer that rises up in someone's heart serves to open us, for us, the door of heaven. That person stands in converse with the divinity and gives pleasure to the Son of God. Prayer makes peace with the Lord's anger and with the vehemence of his wrath in his way to Tears that well up in the eyes can open the door of compassion. So a final message for us. After the Second World War and suffering in Dakar concentration camp, Bishop Nikolai Velimirovich, rather than returning to communist Yugoslavia, chose exile in the USA, believing that he could serve his people more effectively with the freedom to speak and teach. And he eventually found himself at St. Tikhon's monastery and seminary, where he could do just that. In a letter to the graduates in 1953, he warned them about the temptation of insignificance. We are tempted to think of the Orthodox Church nowadays plays an insignificant role in the world, that those who are about to be ordained to the priesthood should not be ashamed of the apostolic suffering of their church. They should see those hardships in the light of a larger perspective, the history of the Orthodox Church, which is not only apostolic in doctrine, but in suffering too. St. Ephraim's poem on the Pearl sums up this prose. Righteous suffering is the hallmark of the members of Christ's body. There is a necessary interaction between belief and practice. Christians, through their suffering, draw others to Christ, just as Christ draws us to himself through his cross. We are not insignificant beings. We are significant. We are significant because we are, first of all, inexpressibly and inexhaustibly loved by God. And secondly, because in that love, we become a sign for others. We are not 
significant in and of ourselves, but through, through him who adopts us as his sons and daughters. Through the grace of baptism, he it is, the spirit of truth, who fillest all things, who calls us to be harps of the spirit. Last week I had an indulgent expedition to Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra to listen to Nigel Kennedy, a famous violinist. He has a distinct style, a brilliance of performance, a unique cadence, a signature of playing. And likewise, St. Ephraim, one sees a unique underlying brilliance and combination of theology and verse. In the 1989 film, The Dead Poets Society, an English teacher inspires and encourages his bored students for the love of poetry with the words, make your lives extraordinary. Well, we in the Live Poets Society can do more than that. We can make lives new in Christ. Forgive me for being wide-ranging and so long, and so eclectic. But this is the nature of the poet. Likewise, St. Ephraim, we are to see the interconnectedness of all things. In culture, in ecology, in time, in space. The spiritual man may be dissatisfied with himself. But that dissatisfaction can be the catalyst for repentance. <coughs> Tears and movement, as it was for St. Ephraim. It may engender humility, as it did for St. Ephraim. Exile may open the way to a new dimension of service to God, as it did for St. Ephraim. But we must never lose heart and fall into that feeling of emptiness or despair. Such apostolic suffering, such grit in the shell, makes the pearl. Becomes the moment of transformation and rejoicing, since it means we have growth in Christ. I leave you with the poetry of another modern saint, St. Nikolai Vilimurevich, and the beautiful prayers by the lake. In God's will, may you all become saints. May you all become poets.